Hi there, everybody. This week, we're going to be working with more raster data, and it's pretty fun data. It's the Mars surface. Believe it or not, you can download DEMs of the Mars surface. How cool is that? Okay, so what we're going to have you do is summarize the surface. We're going to have you calculate like the depth of these two craters that I've digitized here. I'm just kind of digitized the rim to give you an idea of uh, what area you're shooting for. So we're going to have you calculate the depth of these two craters, um, not the elevation at the bottom, but the difference between the top to the bottom. And then we're also going to have you calculate the mean slope. So you're going to have to calculate a couple of new surfaces. Um, one of them is a hill shade to give you that three-dimensional look that you'll be using um, for your submission, which is to make a beautiful professional map of uh, one of the craters. Um, and then you're also going to be calculating a new slope surface based on the elevations in the um, elevation model here. So notice I don't have a base map on. Why? Because we don't have a base map of the Mars surface. So this will display over a base map of the, the globe, the Earth globe, um, but that's kind of ridiculous um, to show it that way. So turn off your base map, get rid of it. Um, you know, this, this data set here has an origin um, and has units of meters, and so it will plot up on an Earth base map, but it's nonsensical. Okay, so another uh, heads up that I want to make sure you're aware of this, this time around is that um, these um, raster tools that you're going to be running don't allow spaces in the file name or in the path. And I've been warning you about that all semester. Um, and, and I said you'll get away with it for now, but it's going to start biting you in the butt as we get into raster analyses. So make sure your file names and your paths, like if you're using a folder called GIS work with no with no underscore but a space in it, the, the fact that that space is anywhere in the path to your file will cause an error. And the error is really general. It'll just say, sorry, generic error. And it's going to be up to you to understand that it's because you've got a space in your path somewhere. So be really careful. Um, one shortcut if you run into that while you're running a, a tool is just to save the output to the desktop because the desktop is generally set up um, with a path that doesn't contain any spaces. Okay, what else? Um, let's talk about hill shades. So we're going to be using the geoprocessing tools. So let's type in hill shade. I already ran one of these because I screwed something up earlier. But um, you'll see there's two different tool boxes that have the hill shade tool. Use the spatial analyst toolbox. So you always create hill shades, not always, but almost always create hill shades from the elevation model. We want our output raster to be um, placed somewhere where we know we can find it. I created a folder called Mars underscore surface, um, and I already ran it and called it. Um, I like the, the naming convention of using the name of the DEM underscore HS for hill shade. That way in my files, they're organized together. Um, so I'm going to cancel that. The azimuth and altitude you can leave. Um, I'll show you why in just a second. You don't have to model the shadows. You can if you want. It doesn't really make any difference. And just leave the Z factor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just add mine because I already because I already ran it. So add data. And whoopsie. Go to my GIS work. And Okay, so here's my hill shade. Pyramids, yes, you always need to draw pyramids. Helps speed things up a little bit. And if we zoom in here, you see now we've got the 3D surface that we really like to see when we're looking at elevation models. I put a color ramp on the elevations themselves, but the hill shade, these, just, um, these values only mean what color of gray they are, and you always leave it black to white. So what happens if you don't use white for the high values and and dark for the low values. See how these look like dunes? And this is clearly a depression. If I reverse that, hopefully you'll see this, that these now look like depressions. Can you see that? And then this looks like a hill. Our eye is used to seeing surfaces lit from a certain angle. And that's why it's really important that you keep these oriented the right way, which is um, the high values for white and the low values black. Now these go back to looking like dunes. Um, I also like to organize my data by keeping the hill shade full strength. 
um, completely opaque, but putting transparency on the elevation values, which you do in the Appearance tab up here. Oops, I just did that on the wrong one to have it highlighted. So it's at about 43%. And so you can see um, if I change that and make the elevations opaque, see how flat it looks? Making that see-through, it allows the hill shade to kind of show through the elevations. We get a combination of color from the elevations and the three-dimensional effect from the hill shade. Okay, let's take a look at the zonal statistics tool. Um, because what that does, it sounds like a weird name, but zonal statistics takes a zone, and in our case we have two. We have these polygons that map the rim of the two craters. Those are the zones that we care about. And we're going to use these zones to summarize um, raster values. So remember the raster is just a set of pixels or cells, and let's just zoom in and look at them really quick. Um, one of the things that you're going to be doing in this lab is telling us again what the resolution is, um, what the coordinate system is. So you're going to be using the properties and checking that stuff out. But you can see the individual pixels here, right? So one thing we could do is just use the measure tool and figure out how big these are. This is just going to be a, uh, let's do it, just a ballpark. But if we measure the width of one of these cells, it's about a meter. So that would make this a one meter DEM, right? That's, the, that's how wide one pixel is on the ground. So all of the elevations are being averaged over a one meter by one meter um, area. Okay, back to what I was doing. Let's zoom to this layer. Okay, so zonal statistics is gonna summarize the values from a raster in the zones that we're interested in. That's what zonal statistics does. Um, if you run the tool zonal statistics, it's going to summarize one statistic for you, and, the, and the, the different statistics are minimum, so it would give you an output that would give you the minimum elevation, for example, for this zone, and the minimum elevation for this zone, if you ran zonal statistics on elevation. Um, so we've got minimum, maximum, mean, we've got range, majority, minority, um, standard deviation. These are the kinds of statistics that we can run on these zones. Why would we want to do that? Well, what if your zone was a watershed and you wanted to know what the maximum slope of you know, 2,000 different watersheds were or the average elevation? Or maybe you wanted to know the change in elevation. So what's the difference between the, the highest and the lowest elevations within a watershed? Millions of reasons you might want to use zonal statistics. It's a really cool tool. But it's not necessarily helpful to run one statistic at a time. So let's go back to our geoprocessing window. And let's run not zonal statistics, but zonal statistics as a table. This tool is going to run all the statistics for you at once, but it doesn't output a new shape file. It outputs a table, just a standalone table. OK. so. Let's try running it just on elevation. You're going to run zonal statistics twice, once on elevation and once on slope. So the first input is to input the raster. Don't stop there. Keep reading. Or feature zone data. Zone is the critical word here. So what zones do we have to work with? Our two craters. Those are the areas that we want to summarize the elevations within. So I'm going to put craters in there. Hey, look, it defaulted a, a, a new field for us. The zone field that it's going to use to determine the craters is ID. That sounds good. Let's just keep going. No, don't accept default settings. Let's look at the attribute for craters and see what would happen. So in the attribute table, um, the ID field has a zero for both craters. That means if you run zonal statistics, it's going to treat these two areas like they're the same thing and give you the statistics combined for these. We want to know what the, you know, what the average elevation for this one is and the average ele ele uh, elevation for this crater separately. So we have to put in a unique identifier, a field that contains a unique identifier. And we have two that we can choose from, either FID or name. So moral of the story, don't accept default settings <laughs> in ARC. 
they're probably always going to be wrong. Okay, that's not always true. Um, what am I doing? Zooming to layer. Okay, back to geoprocessing. Zonal statistics, that's not going to work. I'm going to use name. That way I know which one's Herschel. Um, input value raster. What, what values do I want to summarize? I definitely don't want to summarize the hillshade values because that would be dumb. I would just know what color gray is the most, you know, the median color of gray or something. I want to know something about the elevations. So let's put in the elevation model. Output table we need to make sure is going into our same. Okay. And let's call it zonal statistics on elevation. Notice that it's the output type is a table, not a shape file. Um, we want to calculate all statistics. You could choose to just do one, but we want all. And I'm going to run. Oh, I can schedule it to run later. That's pretty hilarious. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, so notice it added just a table, a standalone table to my uh, table of contents. It doesn't give me um, a new shape file. So this is a little bit different tool, but we can open that attribute table and we got two results. Yay! So we have um, with the Herschel creator and then we have the other cr creator. So let's look at what these statistics are. Um, count, what do you think the count is? What is it counting? So if I if I go down here and look, well, this is set up not very well. Let's drag this down and zoom in a little bit. Okay. Within this crater circle, what do you think this count means? 763,671 what? Well, I'll just tell you. This is the number of pixels in the elevation raster that are found within this circle. Um, the min, what do you think these are? And do they make sense? I'm gonna let you think about that. What's the range then? So if this is the minimum from the elevation model, and this is the maximum value within this zone for the elevation model, what do you think the range is? And because this is kind of drawn um, slightly outside the rim of the crater, it's going to contain both the maximum value of elevation and the minimum value for elevation. So this is the depth. Then we've got the mean. This is the mean elevation. So if you just looked at all, whatever this is, 1,156,256 cells, this is the mean elevation, standard deviation, and then the sum. So this value here makes no sense. It's if you added up, whoa, added up all of the elevations for every pixel within this crater. Okay, so that's it. I'm not going to walk you through slope. I'm not going to walk you through the question answers, but that's how zonal statistics works. And if you have any questions, let us know. Thanks.